I, I titled my talk today, The Age of Artificial Intelligence. Um, it sounded sort of uh, serious and important. And um, uh, I, I think uh, it was a bit of theatrics, but I really do believe it's, it is serious and important right now, um, the evolution of intelligent machines and what that means and this uh, partnership between us humans and our machines that we've been working with so long to create uh, much of the fabric and the uh, physical reality of our society right now. Um, we've done a lot of uh, interesting things with machines, very remarkable things, um, you know, just going from uh, a few hundred years ago, just sort of uh, living in what, you know, stone huts and whatnot, uh, to today, this is uh, the skyline of Singapore. Um, you know, if you could have watched that being built over time, you'd see all sorts of machines, cranes moving things about, uh, placing things. Um, you wouldn't have been able to see behind that, though, um, you know, the architects and structural engineers working on the design of these buildings, uh, making sure they can withstand various levels of, uh, you know, earthquake, typhoon, other kinds of stresses uh, that will be placed on them. So on this, we've done, we've built fantastic things with machines. Um, the bargain has always been that we're the smart ones and they're the muscle and the brawn, right? And, uh, you know, their muscle doesn't just build things, but it takes us to amazing places. Uh, where we can look back and reflect on where we've come from. And then we can only go so far. Uh, you know, ourselves as humans, we have certain needs, uh, but we can build machines that go even farther than we can and report back to us on what they see uh, at the outer edges of the solar system or, um, you know, our robotic children can wake up on the surface of Mars and tell us what they saw and follow our directions on what they should look at next. So as we built these machines and they've gotten uh, smarter, uh, the weird thing was when they got smarter than us. Um, uh, chess, chess was sort of uh, you know a, a key example to many of uh, the early researchers in AI of really a, a thinking person's endeavor. You have to think and plan and model your opponent, and learn uh, from uh, their play, and it was a remarkable thing in 1997 when uh, Deep Blue uh, defeated Kasparov. Um, remarkable to a lot of people, but not to Herb Simon, who uh, was one of the fathers of AI. In 1958, in a speech, uh, he said, it's uh, not my aim to surprise or shock you, although I think it kind of was. Um, but there are now in the world, this is 1958, uh, there are now in the world machines uh, that can think, can learn, and create, and their ability to do these things is going to increase rapidly. Um, he went on to predict uh, that within 10 years, uh, uh, the uh, human chess champion would, would lose to a machine. So he was off a little bit, but I think on the overall technological time scale, being off just a, a couple decades is not so, not so far. Um, Simon, interestingly, won the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, he actually got into artificial intelligence uh, just uh, by trying to model uh, human decision making and how we worked, and that got him into trying to make machines that would simulate that. Um, chess became um, this very romantic uh, goal uh, for the AI community in, in that time. You know, in, in that time in the 1950s, uh, it was just around the time the whole uh, notion of AI, uh, the, the name AI had been coined um, by a guy named John McCarthy. And um, uh, somehow or another, everybody who was doing AI, AI played chess. And so it became uh, sort of uh, one of these um, key emblems of the whole endeavor. And it, it, it found its way into popular culture, too. You see in 2001, A Space Odyssey, Hal playing chess with the uh, the crew and um, Spock playing against the ship's computer. And this is what really uh, inspired me as a kid. Um, uh, both uh, sort of a short-lived interest in model rocketry, and fortunately my eyebrows grew back after the explosion. Um, but uh, a lifelong interest in artificial intelligence that um, uh, really I, I got so inspired when I went to um, Stanford as an undergrad. One of the first uh, uh, programming assignments uh, they gave in the early uh, series of programming classes was a 3D tic-tac-toe uh, program. And, and the annoying thing about that program uh, was that you would be playing it, and then all of a sudden it would tell you uh, you were going to lose in eight moves. And um, it was sort of irritating. You know, Even though I had written the program myself, uh, and I, I understood what was behind it, but as I was playing it, I wasn't seeing this. And it was really uh, sort of strange to be having my own creation uh, kind of taunting me in this way. And uh, so I... Uh, I mentioned uh, this guy named uh, John McCarthy who made up uh, the, the term I coined the term. Uh, he was actually a professor there and uh, was kind enough just to take me to lunch as a lowly undergrad and explain to me the, the field of AI and where it was and what the frontiers were. And uh, for me, um, you know, it, maybe for some of you too, the, it, when you go to school, most disciplines, uh, they're presented as, uh, here's what we know. And uh, indeed, for many disciplines, uh, you know, think of physics, chemistry, um, you know, uh, the key advances happened a century ago, perhaps more. Um, 
and now we're kind of filling in the gaps, but it sort of seems like it's uh, mostly understood. And with AI and understanding the human brain, how do we think, how can we make computers think, it was so obvious that it was you know, maybe a few percent known and you know, 90 plus percent unknown. It was very inspiring. Uh, McCarthy uh, used to take a, he used to teach a class at Stanford uh, called Technological Opportunities for Humanity. McCarthy was an amazing optimist, and, and really he just looked at so many things uh, in our world and uh, wondered about, well, you know, couldn't a robot do that? And it was um, an interesting thing. Uh, in his mind, well, of course, of course it could, um, even though it hadn't, uh, robotics and AI technology hadn't achieved that proficiency at, at that time. But it, it sort of a, it grew in me this sort of sense of looking at the world, which I think is part of the culture of AI generally as a discipline. So normal people, uh, if you saw a cook uh, making a pizza at some uh, restaurant, uh, uh, you know, placing the pepperonis and so forth, you might think just, mm, pizza. Um, but, uh, you know, somebody who's, who studies robotics and AI, you look at that and you think, there should really be a robot for that. Uh, why, why does that person toil day after day, you know, pushing the sauce around, just throwing the cheese around? Sometimes you get the good slice that has just the right amount of sauce. Sometimes they've skipped a little bit of sauce on the slice you got. And the pepperonis, right, should there be 21, 22? There's some optimal number of pepperonis. So why, why do they get placed uh, randomly? Um, there actually is... Uh, there actually is a vending machine now that uh, you, you put in your money and uh, a few minutes later out, out comes uh, pizza. So uh, this, uh, there ought to be a robot for that. I, um, when I stayed at Stanford for my PhD, I ended up working with a guy named Nils Nilsson. He was also uh, kind of one of the early fathers of AI and his uh, early project was called Shaky the Robot. Um, initially it wasn't called Shaky, but uh, it, it earned that nickname because it was a little top heavy and abrupt in its motion, so it would sort of wobble around um, as it um, did its thing. But it was uh, one of the first uh, applications of um, really integrating a lot of formerly separate disciplines of AI, vision, natural language understanding, uh, motion sensor effectors. So you could tell Shaky, uh, it, was, it would be in a room, you could tell it, you know, put the block on the table, it would go find the block and put it on the table. Um, and so I, I worked with Nils on robots, but we were interested in programming them uh, not by you know, writing a lot of uh, code that says precisely, here's what you do in this situation, here's what you do in that situation, but we really wanted just to drive them around and have them learn, okay, if this is, in, in, as I was driven around, I was doing this in this situation, we wanted the robot to just sort of learn more generally what it should do. So uh, learning uh, looks sort of like this, uh, what's on, behind me. So there's a, a lot of information about a situation. Let's say one row up there is sort of one uh, robot observation. Of, I'm in this situation. Ones and zeros represent maybe where it is, what direction it's pointing, whether there's a thing in its hand. And then that final one or zero might represent uh, what its next action should be, maybe turn left, turn right. Um, but there's just millions of uh, problems that can be expressed this way. Uh, you can think of credit card fraud transactions, uh, fraud scoring when you're, when you're using a credit card. So the ones and zeros might be information about you and your account balances and typical purchases. Other ones and zeros might represent this particular transaction that's happening right now. And that final one or zero might be, well, is this likely to be a fraudulent transaction or is it really likely to be you? Or it might be an ad, or showing an ad to someone, did they respond or not? So I've, I've had this up here a long time. There's a little quiz at the bottom. Uh, does anybody know what's that last one, one or zero? Um, so, uh, this is the this is the world these these robots or machines live in. Uh, yeah, you're fifty percent chance. So one of you <laughs> one of you gets the prize, or maybe half of you rather. Um, so, uh, but in this case, uh, the the pattern is is all contained within the first five uh, bits. We would call them ones and zeros, um, and it's just simply a, at least three are, are among the first five are, are ones. So this is the kind of chore that machines go through all the time. We just talked about big data. And it's, it's not that exciting just to have uh, big data. What's exciting is to look through it and try to find these patterns that you can then use to make uh, decisions. Um, in AI, uh, there's, um, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of questions you can ask, like, what's really AI? Um, early on in the field, it actually was sort of uh, brilliant, but also uh, unintended consequence uh, uh, created some setbacks. Uh, early on, uh, Alan Turing, a, a British mathematician, uh, defined something called, um, well, later we, we came to call it the Turing test of, you know, could you have a, an AI, uh, you know, bot chatting with a person in a way that uh, the person couldn't tell if it was a, a human or an AI bot they were talking with? That led to a lot of efforts in sort of full AI. But honestly, um, there's a lot of things that they, all we really want is competence. You know, um, there's a lot of things we need we do that we don't really need a, a full uh, human being to do. We just need a piece of you know our, our functionality. So, for example, uh, navigation in cars. Um, it's actually Nils uh, Nilsson I mentioned earlier uh, developed a search algorithm that's actually used. To, if you say, I'm here and I would like to be there, <laughs> it's, it's uh, that algorithm that essentially works through the map, the network of streets to try to figure out that path. That used to be the kind of thing you would see a research paper on at uh, uh, AAAI or IJCHI, these are artificial intelligence conferences. Uh, now, of course, you all just have them and it, it, uh, it's hardly even noticeable. And it's an interesting thing. Um, 
it inverts a little bit. I, I talked about machines before, and, and we used to be the smart ones, and the machines would sort of do the grunt work. Uh, car navigation, it's kind of the opposite, you know, uh, figuring out how to actually get uh, somewhere, that sort of planning and thinking, that seems to be the intellectual part of it, and then just, you know, holding onto the wheel and not crashing into things. Uh, <laughs> seems like that's actually not the most intelligent part of it. Uh, and of course, e even that now, uh, I live in Northern California, and you'll see the Google self-driving cars um, on Highway 101 all the time. And Eric Schmidt, uh, I love this one quote from him, uh, said uh, it's basically a bug that cars were invented before AI. Um, it's tremendous, you know, the casualties actually in terms of uh, injury and death that result from uh, primarily sort of human inattention um, and just the inability to kind of solve the simultaneous equations quickly enough to kind of keep ourselves uh, safe, but we won't have to worry about that uh, pretty soon. Um, interestingly, uh, self-driving cars have been around since the late 80s. Uh, this is actually a, a research project at Carnegie Mellon where Herb Simon used to be a professor. Um, using a neural network to drive. It turns out, uh, for most driving, when, when the job is staying in the lane, there's, there's really not that much to it. <laughs> so even the computers uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s could handle it. Um, but I think right now, what we're seeing is just a, a real pro proliferation of applications of AI. You know, just, just uh, in the last few months, uh, this robots take over uh, cover story on Wired. There was uh, actually an article in there about a robot uh, comedian, so we're worried about the career of Jimmy Fallon in the future. And um, you know, Atlantic was covering uh, Watson's application in, in medicine. The robot will see you now. Um, so, uh, and th there's just uh, all of these things. So if, if you were in AI, uh, you know, since the 70s and 80s, I mean, we've been trying this forever. <laughs> so there was very early projects at Stanford called Mycin and eMycin that were trying to build uh, robot doctors to diagnose uh, diseases based on uh, symptoms being shown. But it's all kind of uh, happening now. And I think there's this uh, common theme of uh, you know welcoming our new overlords uh, that. Uh, uh, you're seeing now, and it's interesting. So, um, you know, I think I think we should welcome them. They're still just here to help, and they're not. Uh, you know, it's not like you're you'll lose your wife to a robot one day. But um, you know, th there's uh, there's a lot of functionality there, and there's a lot of things we spend our time doing that you sort of wonder. You know, was that really the best way to do it? Um, interestingly, the um, the defeat of Kasparov by uh, Deep Blue um, that we I showed earlier, just to talk about the changing attitudes. Actually, forgive me, uh, Financial Times, for using reader comments uh, to point out something. But um, the, uh, if you look at the comments on an article uh, on the 15-year anniversary of Kasparov uh, losing to Deep Blue, uh, one of the comments there says, why is this even a big deal? Like, we don't cry about a, a car uh, you know, driving faster than a human runner. Why are we, wouldn't it be obvious that the machine would be better? <laughs> it's, it's amazing to me, because if you've been in this long enough, you know, people used to think it was insane. Uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, how could a computer ever beat a human at chess? It's, it's a thinking uh, human activity. And so it kind of uh, begs the question, like, what does it even mean to be human when certain things that uniquely defined us before are actually doable uh, by these machines? Um, machines are useful not just at uh, you know, games, but, but making serious uh, uh, financial impact. Um, there's a, a hedge fund in the US uh, founded by a, a former Stony Brook math professor, Jim Simons, uh, called Renaissance. It's a very secretive company, so there's not much about it. I tried to find as much as I could, and all I could find was this one sentence about the company um, on their website. Uh, but uh, you know, digging around uh, some other websites, uh, so Jim is, is now worth himself nearly $12 billion. A very active philanthropist, so he's not uh, greedily keeping it all to himself. But really, it was uh, Renaissance is one of the first and uh, strongest companies at leveraging AI, uh, machine learning, other sort of advanced uh, techniques uh, to trade uh, money on the, in the financial world. Um, interestingly, as I was doing research for the talk, there was sort of like a meta experience I had with AI. Um, I'm on Forbes here, uh, trying to make sure I'm, I'm giving you the right numbers on uh, Jim's net worth. And I'm, I was at the same time kind of planning a, a trip uh, on my computer and some other tabs. And so I'm getting ads from uh, Virgin America uh, being served to me by my own company, Rocket Fuel, <laughs> which uses AI uh, to try to figure out uh, what ads people might actually want to see. And this personalization of uh, content it's something that's uh, uh, been quite significant, even with uh, you know, Amazon in the US using a recommendation engine to try to engage users, uh, Rocket Fuel using personalization to try to deliver uh, interesting ads to people. You're just seeing a lot of this uh, algorithmic curation now uh, of our experiences. Um, in terms of uh, this inversion between um, you know, what, what's thinking and what's, um, you know, what's sort of the, uh, the manual labor part of the job, there are now these automated factories using a, a system called Kiva so instead of having humans walk around, excuse me, not factories, warehouses, instead of having humans walking through the warehouse trying to grab all the items you've ordered from some e-commerce uh, vendor, uh, with Kiva, uh, smart shelves come to you, the human packer, and 
it's, it's sort of um, insulting to me. It, it doesn't even have a readout that tells you what thing to grab. There's actually a little laser pointer that sort of squiggles on the box you're supposed to reach in and grab one thing of and pack. Um, and it's only, at that point, the human in that loop is only an eyeball and a hand, and even that, you know, you can bet gets uh, automated in a, a couple of years. Um, there's, uh, interestingly, a, a few articles about uh, AI. For some reason, they, a, a few articles, uh, people said, well, you know, uh, we've automated this, we've automated that, but, you know, there's still toll takers, and in fact, there aren't anymore on, on the most famous uh, bridge uh, I'm aware of being, uh, you know, located near San Francisco in California, the Golden Gate. Um, now it's just systems that either look at an RFID or read the license plate and uh, handle that. And interestingly, again, apologies for putting up a reader comment, but uh, what you see in a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these articles, you'll find readers saying, you know, good for them, you know, for automating this thing, and you know, when can we automate our Congress? Um, it's, it's just funny how prevalent that theme is, actually. Um, you, would, you would expect some of the other, uh, you know, uh, scariness, but in fact, we're, we're eager to automate our, our legislative bodies. Um, so uh, it may have something to do with Congress versus the parliamentary system uh, that we uh, should revisit. Um, but uh, so there, there are other things that used to be um, significant AI uh, frontier projects like facial recognition that are now just simply embedded in consumer devices. I log into my Android tablet simply by looking at it uh, every morning. Um, there's, you can chat with bots to get customer service. A friend of mine was CEO of this company, and he, he said uh, in their chat transcripts they looked at, they even found consumers trying to ask out virtual representatives on dates. Um, AI, uh, AI has, uh, there's applications in science, AI has evolved these uh, antennae, which look weird, moose antlers essentially on this one, but um, uh, they were optimizing a signal gain for micro uh, satellites. Um, there's robots now that can drive uh, along a field in a farm, uh, use a vision system to identify weeds, and zap them with a laser. Um, so if you want to have an organic farm, you don't have to have you know, hundreds of people doing this back-breaking labor of pulling up weeds. Um, uh, France is going to be <laughs> delivering newspapers with drones. I can't wait for that. Um, so there's, um, uh, that's really the vision of John McCarthy. Sadly, he passed away a while ago, but if only he could have lived to see drones delivering uh, newspapers. Um, you know, ham there's a hamburger bot uh, started by a, uh, a team of uh, Stanford students. Um, the, uh, there's actually robots that actually deliver uh, food to you in restaurants in China. Um, interestingly, just in terms of uh, the vision on all this, um, uh, this researcher at Santa Cruz says uh, it's a silly human conceit that there would be a domain, essentially, that only we are able to solve with our wetware brains. And a little picture of Go. After, after computers got to be the best at chess, uh, people said, well, at least there's Go. This is a much more complex game. But even uh, computers are, are beating not grandmasters, but, but human uh, masters at Go now. Uh, a couple of interesting books you, to, I'd recommend. Automate This is a fantastic story of a lot of other types of uh, automation that are happening right now. And Race Against the Machine really gets towards the societal implications. What does it mean uh, when there's this uh, flood of new technologies now um, that are, uh, uh, have sort of uh, pros and cons in terms of uh, societal impact? So my, my main point here is that if you look at um, the evolution of computation uh, from the Holler tabulating machine to even Salesforce.com, a relatively modern system, um, both of those essentially are just systems into which you type letters and numbers into boxes. Uh, the system stores them, retrieves them, adds them up once in a while. And the gap between that and, and the thing like Watson, which is autonomously um, you know, answering questions on a, a broad domain, is, is significant. And it's uh, just a new world that we're entering, uh, this um, age of AI. And I, I wanted to close with um, a quote from Nils. We were at a conference at the um, Santa Fe Institute um, uh, on reinforcement learning, and uh, Noel sits back at the table and says, you know, the point of all this is to spend more time at the beach. So I think the, uh, you know, the dream of those of us that work on AI is, is that we can really create the society of abundance where uh, so much of uh, what we need is no longer really constrained uh, by uh, having to have people just kind of, you know, do horrible, you know, redundant or, uh, you know, toiling labor uh, to provide. And if we can have a world where um, a lot of our needs are, are satisfied, it's, uh, it gives us more time at the beach. So thank you.